Um, I apologize for speaking in this horrible provincial accent, but you know what can you do? I grew up in America. Um, so anyway, uh, I work for a, uh, basically it's a Hadoop consultancy called Think Big Analytics. And, and this is really a talk about what's good and bad about Hadoop, you know, just from you know, years of experience and then dealing with this ecosystem. And, and uh, so I'll describe what MapReduce is for those of you that don't know, and then we'll discuss some of the things that are good and bad about it and then where I see the future heading. And you can get, the slides will be on the conference site. You can also pull them off the last link there, my Polyglot Programming website. Uh, shameless plug, I, I've written a couple of books. Actually, this one is about a tool in the Hadoop ecosystem, a SQL query tool, and I think the others are self-explanatory, and they happen to be available in the lobby. Uh, all right, well, we had the, <laughs> this slide was, of course, created before the uh, panel discussion today, but uh, I wanted to give you my definition of big data, and I'll let you verify that the math is correct for some definition of correct. Um, this is a town in Colorado. And the EST is established, you know, when it was founded. But um, so, so for me, I mean, this is a marketing buzzword, but uh, the, the context for the talk is data that has gotten so big, for some definition of big, that it's uh, either too slow or too expensive to manage. Um, why do I have too small there? Anyway, don't know why that's there. Um, <laughs> too slow, too big, or too expensive to use with traditional technologies. And so people went looking for alternatives. And also behind uh, this talk is three trends that, I've, uh, that are happening right now in the industry, some of which I think you know already, but maybe a couple aren't quite as obvious. Um, the, the first obvious one is that obviously data sizes are getting a lot bigger. For some people like the Twitters and the Facebooks and the Googles of the world, dramatically bigger data sets in the last you know, couple decades. Um, but even for smaller companies, either they are realizing they've got a lot of data that's just sitting there that might be valuable for, in some, some sense for mining purposes, or they're interested in starting to mine social network working for, uh, you know, like Twitter streams, as we heard earlier today in this session, in this uh, track. And so they need to manage a lot more data and be able to do computation over that data. So this is an obvious one. The other one, I brought this up in our panel discussion earlier, and that is that the notion of really carefully defining your schemas is diminishing in importance, just as it's sort of a response to pressure of the world in which we live. You know, it used to be you would spend a lot of time building systems, and you'd have enough time to think carefully about the schema. Uh, I, I was thinking earlier about the, the classic object-oriented programming books that came out in the late 80s and early 90s, where they all use the uh, automated teller machine as, a, as an example application. And what's interesting about that from this context is that, you know, that was pretty much a self-contained system. You know, it was a private network. You know, they, they thought very carefully about it because obviously there was money on the line, so they had to be very careful about how they worked. So they spent a lot of time designing data schemas and <coughs> protocols and so forth. Whereas, you know, in contrast to today for these, you know, typical big data problems, you're absorbing data from all kinds of sources. The schemas, you know, are completely all over the map if there is even kind of a, a, a sense of a schema for a particular data source. The schemas are changing rapidly. So we're finding that we need to be more flexible in handling the data that's thrown at us and worry less about adopting formal representations of the data. And not only does this apply at the database level, but it really affects the notion of whether we should do object modeling in our, in our uh, applications. And the other cool phenomenon that's going on is a lot more emphasis on data-driven programs. And now here I'm showing a picture of version two, I think it is, of a car named Stanley. This was Google's self-driving car that uh, won, I think actually it was the previous generation that won the DARPA Grand Challenge. Uh, DARPA is uh, the defense uh, department in the U.S.'s uh, research agency that funds advanced research, and they created this DARPA Challenge, which was to have a, an autonomous car drive through a desert, uh, you know, it wasn't an obstacle course, but there was, you know, rough roads navigate that in so many hours rather than, you know, you could, you could pretty easily design one that would creep along a few inches at a time and very carefully determine where it is. But if you wanted something that could actually run at normal driving speeds and not run off the road, that was a much bigger challenge. And this team at Google and, and uh, with, with con uh, contributors from Stanford uh, developed this technology, which actually does a lot of very cool stuff. And you can see some of the electronics on the top for laser imaging and echo location as well as GPS. Uh, data for like maps and, and they use all this stuff to avoid hitting pedestrians and the cars in front of them and staying on the road and so forth and uh, 
So that's just one example of how we're just driving our world more with data and, and making, uh, using very generic algorithms, sometimes very specialized and sophisticated, but nevertheless somewhat generic about the world in which they're supposed to reason about. And then they're using the data to infer the right behaviors or information that they're supposed to gather from that data. And, and Rich uh, Hickey sort of alluded to this last night, when, or yesterday afternoon, when he was talking about um, you know, protocols and how we should focus on like uh, attribute uh, oriented data, you know, like key value pairs and stuff. Very similar notion. So those three trends kind of uh, beg the question, well, what kind of architectures should we you know, build our systems around to support these needs? Well, this is sort of the traditional way we've been doing things the last couple of decades where you know, we might have some business logic, maybe there's a web server on top of this thing, but it's sending, it's triggering some query that goes into our database. Maybe the results come back through an object relational mapper, or maybe the query itself goes through there. And then we, we used to go through all the ceremony of converting this to some nice in-memory domain model as objects, and then that got shoved back into the domain logic and, you know, this sort of endless cycle. And you know, once again, that kind of worked pretty well for things like the, the systems we were building 20, 30 years ago, the ATMs and so forth. But it's not so flexible for the kind of problems we're dealing with today, where it's really a lot more sensible to, instead of trying to hide these res result sets, which are essentially collections of data, actually fully embrace them and really apply our energies towards using them in the most effective way. And the most effective way is to have things like our functional combinators that some of the gurus in the room here have evangelized very well. Things like your folds and your maps and, you know, group buys and things like that. Make those available as generic operations on your maps, lists, trees, whatever, and then combine those together to build up the domain logic without embedding the uh, normal object-oriented style domain logic in the code. If I had to give you one thing that I think is the way that object-oriented programming got off the rails, so to speak, it would be we sort of bought into this view that it actually is a good idea to move our domain logic into our code in a very faithful representation with all the same uh, nouns and verbs. In fact, I think that tended to create somewhat inflexible bloat. Objects tend not to be as reusable as we thought, in part because everybody has their own notion of a person their own notion of a bank account, and so they don't interoperate well. Whereas, it's pretty much the same if it's a map or a, you know, a list or something, whether I'm getting it from a Java process or an Erlang process or whatever, and so that actually turns out to be a lot more reusable. So one of the big themes I've found that really fits the big data space is to fully embrace collections, the, the things that the functional programming community has been telling us to do for a long time and really build the kind of combinator operators on those collections that we can then very con uh, concisely glue together to construct our domain logic. And the other thing about this is it addresses the size problem, whereas th there's just too much overhead in the old object-oriented approach. There's a whole lot more uh, scalability in an approach like this where we're getting a lot of the boilerplate out of the way in the middle. And the other thing about this, uh, well, I'll get back to this in a second, but Anyway, really embracing these data structures as the core representations of our data and not so much relying on ad hoc abstractions and uh, representations of domain concepts that change all the time. Now, just to fill out the details a little bit, it, there was a really good reason why we thought it was good to put object models into our domain uh, or into our code, and that was the communication side of things where the developer was talking the same language as the stakeholder, you know, the marketing person or whoever it was giving us requirements. And I think the nice way of recovering that benefit in, in a functional design is to rely on uh, DSLs. So we've had some talks about DSLs here, including from Leonard earlier. I think that's a wonderful way to bridge that gap between these sort of low-level implementation but highly efficient constructs, highly productive constructs, and the world of the domain logic that we have to live in. So I'm a big believer in DSL, sort of above the, the top box there. Anyway, that's a little bit off the topic of this talk. But just to fill out uh, this notion of which architectures work best for big data, th the other thing I've seen over the years working in, uh, in the trenches is that objects models tend to build into these big amorphous systems where all of the uh, 
uh, data flows through the system, all the use cases of behavior, if you will, all tend to flow through one massive wad of object-oriented code in the middle. And a lot of people find it very difficult to tease this apart into separable services. And that's really bad for a lot of reasons, and the main one being that if we want to scale to massive data sets, we need to be able to scale horizontally, as we all know. And the best way to do that is to have these little single responsible uh, pro uh, pro uh, processes. In other words, they do one thing, and they do it well, and then we just run data through them and glue the results together in some way. So if we need to scale, then we can replicate the processes over and over again, and we can have you know, different service, servers providing different processes. Hey, and we can even scale those services for the particular service they're doing. So if this one is I.O. bound, we can give it better I.O. performance than this one, which needs more CPU or whatever. So this is all kind of hand wavy about uh, where I think we need to go. But just to recap how this fits these three uh, trends, this does better address the need of growing data sizes because it's much easier to replicate and scale horizontally with uh, you know, a much more fine-grained focused uh, architecture. And then the, the last two really are very closely related where if, I'm, if I have more agnostic processes that just know how to work with our fundamental collections and they're more data-driven, then it's a lot easier to address rapid schema evolution as well as programs that really are driven by the data rather than the other way around. And that gets us back towards MapReduce where the goal of MapReduce and the distributed file systems that were built along with it is to kind of fit this model where we, we distribute data over you know, a, a cluster because that's the only way to, to virtualize you know, petabytes of data and yet make it look like one file system. And it also gives us things like failover uh, safety and, and that sort of thing. But also at the MapReduce level, the goal was to find a generic processing framework that would mostly handle the boilerplate of this sort of horizontal scalability across services and managing what's going on and collecting data back together, but give us a programming model that then we can then write our business logic to. So how many of you actually know what MapReduce is or have ever done anything with MapReduce or Hadoop? Okay, most of you. So I'll just go through the next few slides quickly just to make sure we're all on the same page. And what I want to do is just walk through an example, of maybe the simplest MapReduce program called WordCount. And in fact, it's often called the hello world of, of this space because it, whenever a developer writes their first MapReduce program, this is usually what they write because conceptually it's easy to understand what's going on. So you can just focus on the API idiosyncrasies. And the idea behind MapReduce is that, or sorry, WordCount, is that imagine I have four documents or some number, some number of documents in a corpus on the left. In this case, they're all very simple documents, and one of them is deliberately left blank, although I didn't actually say this document deliberately left blank, because that would be confusing. Um, and I want to count all the words that appear in this corpus, uh, you know, first find all the words and then count them, and then you know, output a list of all the words and their counts. And this is more than just a toy problem. There's actually some uh, utility to this. For example, if you're building a spell checker and you're, you're spell checking English and someone types T-H-E-X, well, you can guess that they probably meant to type either no fourth character or uh, maybe N or something like that. Even if you uh, are trying to infer what language you're looking at, if you see the word the a lot, well, you probably can guess it's English, for example. So there's actually some usefulness for this kind of data set. But anyway, we need to fill in the magic in the middle to get from the input documents to these, and there'll be three output documents. And this is the basic structure of MapReduce, where we have to fill in logic for these sort of rounded bubbles in the mapper and reducer phase. And uh, you functional guys don't wince too much when you see what they actually mean when they use the word map and reduce. It's a bit stretching the definition a little bit, but bear with me. And then there's this magic in the middle called sort and shuffle that we'll have to deal with. So in the uh, Hadoop implementation of MapReduce, if these are text files, what will actually be passed into our code will be uh, key value pairs, where the key will be uh, the position offset into the file, and then each line one at a time. We don't actually care about that offset. We're going to throw that away. We just care about that text that's the value in this case. And all our, what our mapper needs to do is somehow uh, tokenize this uh, text into words. Now, in this case, splitting a white space is sufficient. 
Uh, often when I teach MapReduce, I, we do word count on the, on the plays of Shakespeare, and it turns out Shakespeare used a lot of punctuation, so you have to actually account for some very bizarre punctuation. So it's not as trivial as just splitting a white space to do a good job, but nevertheless, it'll tokenize the words, and then in the most simple version of this algorithm, every time it sees a word, it'll just spit out a new key value pair, which will be the word is the key in a count of one. And you can probably guess of some uh, optimizations, which would be just remember what words you've seen and only write out one key value pair per word with a final count out of each mapper. That's the interesting trade-off there is that's actually more efficient for network I.O., but it's more complex in the implementation, so there's a, a distinct trade-off there. This is logically correct, but it's a little inefficient for network I.O. And now you can see why I have... Um, a blank document just to emphasize the case that this is not really a real map. It's actually more of a flat map operation because you can actually output zero key value pairs or as you can see I'm outputting uh, one to many in fact, or zero to many is what I'm really outputting. So they should have called it flat map reduce but I guess we'll, we'll let it go. Um, so hopefully it's pretty obvious what's going on here. The first one will output, you know, Hadoop uses map reduce and, and so forth down the way. Now what Hadoop and, and also the original Google version do next is a so-called sort and shuffle process where they'll sort all the keys coming out of each mapper. And they do this within each mapper, not globally at this point, because that would be very expensive. And then they, just, they figure out through uh, some mechanism which reducer task should get this. And I should say this, that all of these bubbles are actually separate Java virtual machine processes in the Hadoop case. And by default, it's one mapper per file, but if the file gets beyond a big size, then it actually spins up multiple ones and does it in parallel and so forth. But anyway, so either on some other machines or maybe on the same machine, I'll have these reducer processes running. Uh, I've arranged for all of the keys that start with a number of the letters A through L to go to the first reducer, M through Q to this one, and so forth. So you can see that the first three keys that came out of my first mapper the Hadoop one will go to the first reducer, the map reduce key value pair to the next one, and the uses to the last one, and so forth. And obviously, if we're trying to count the words, we want to make sure that all occurrences of the word map reduce, for example, show up at the same reducer, and so forth. And then we have a trivial task of summing up what we get. So what Hadoop does is it one at a time calls uh, my reduce logic with the key and then a collection of all the values for that key. And in this case, all I have to do is sum the arrays and write out the results and we're done. So they, in, in the Hadoop world, and you can blame Google for this, the, the word mapping is not quite the word that we're, the meaning we're used to. It's actually zero to many output, but it's a transformation from some input to some out, uh, set of outputs. And then reduction is, is more what we're used to, where we want to, in some logical sense, reduce uh, all those key value pairs for a given key down into uh, you know, one output, whatever that means. And of course, this could be another collection of some kind. It doesn't have to be like a number or whatever. So is there any questions on that? Pretty clear what's going on? OK. Now, one issue with that, though, is that word count is reasonably intuitive how to do it. But once you get to anything more advanced, like joins and sorts, it gets really difficult very fast. So one challenge with MapReduce is that it's really hard to translate arbitrary algorithms into something like this. And it's a very coarse-grained model, too. It, when we think of, of mapping and reducing and, sor and uh, um, folding and stuff like that, we tend to think of a lightweight process on a you know, collection that could be big, but nevertheless, the process is small. These are really big processes, single JVM steps. A whole map reduce job is a single map phase, a single reduce phase. If you have to stream them together, you've got to write to disk and then start over, and it's just kind of a mess, and that's sort of one of the issues we'll talk about. All right, briefly, where did we get here, or how did we get here? Well, Google had this problem that they needed to index the interwebs, which are obviously very big, so that when you ask questions like, what is the meaning of life, you get an answer, you know, look at that, 49 million answers in, in 0.26 seconds, which is pretty impressive. Uh, and, you know, we, we, we forget how amazing this is, actually, that we can ask, you know, this web browser questions about the world we live in and, and get these amazing answers in, you know, fractions of a second, over billions of web pages. Well, of course, you all know what actually is going on. They're actually indexing the web in advance. They have crawlers that are constantly looking for new pages and then you know, mapping the, the terms to pages. 
This is happening in advance, and their particular version of this algorithm called PageRank is what made them all billionaires, because it turns out it's so good. But you know, early in the 2000s, they, they realized that not only PageRank, but a whole lot of the data calculations people were doing, all, they all faced the same problem. How do we, I've got this big data set, I want to run some analytics on, how am I going to do it in parallel? I'm going to have to you know, invent some mechanism for distributing the load and monitoring what's going on and then collecting it all back together and so forth. Everyone was reinventing the wheel, so they decided it was time to build some generic infrastructure. And they started with the Google file system, which is a virtualized file system over a cluster, you know, up to petabyte data sizes. And it has things like redundant copies of data so that, you know, when you get to a petabyte size cluster, you're going to lose hard drives every day. So that cannot be a, a, you know, a dramatically bad occurrence. It has to be something that's just routine. And then about a year later, they published this paper, which laid out the MapReduce algorithm for computation that I just described. Well, it turns out that about this time, um, a guy named Doug Cutting, who was the creator of the Lucene search engine, was working on an open source web crawler called Nutch. And he read these papers and realized that, boy, this is exactly what I need in, in this uh, system. So he started working on them. And you know, cutting to the chase here, by 2006, uh, they recognized that these tools were valuable enough to spin them off as a separate project under the umbrella term Hadoop. Where did that word come from and why is there an elephant on this slide? Well, it turns out that he had a young son at the time, he was now an older son, um, who had this little pet stuffed yellow elephant named Hadoop. And actually, I think they pronounced it Hadoop, you know, and it's sort of a made-up name. Well, the amusing story about this elephant is that after Hadoop started to get famous, Doug Cutting would carry this thing around to keynotes. It's sort of like a token of the religion, I guess, an icon. But apparently the family dog ate it a couple of years ago. So that's maybe an ominous sign. I don't know. But uh, anyway. All right. Well, before I start uh, complaining about what's bad about this, let me just briefly. Did the son think of dad going off with his favorite toy? What is, I think by this point, the son was old enough that he didn't care about the elephant anymore. But it's funny. I'm, I saw Doug Cutting at a conference recently. And I asked him if his son knows he's famous. And he said he does. And, uh, but he doesn't let it get to his head. So anyway. Um, all right, so briefly, some of the benefits. Well, as, as we've said, and we all know this, uh, the best way to scale to really massive data sets is to do it horizontally. Uh, you know, CPUs have peaked. And even, even if your data will fit in a big, expensive system, it's still a big, expensive system and doesn't have failover and so forth. One of the interesting design goals uh, that they completely dominate everything about Hadoop works is to absolutely maximize I.O. Um, performance or minimize overhead. In other words, there's some things you simply can't do in Hadoop because they, they want to be able to scan data off hard drives and not have the disk seeking all over the place, which is enormously expensive. And they want to minimize network I.O. because those are the bottlenecks in these systems. And of course, the other major goal was they wanted all this stuff to run on server class commodity hardware. Although it's kind of interesting now that we're starting to, to sort of creep back up into expensive customized hardware to make this run even faster. But the normal way of thinking is just throw more hardware at the problem, and Hadoop will just sort of adapt to the extra hardware. But uh, an unfortunate side effect of these design constraints is that it does make Hadoop really good for batch mode processing, but really sucky at real-time processing. So if you need to be responding to events happening in real time, this is not your tool. We'll talk about some ways to get around that. But if, you know, if offline you're crawling the web to build up a web index, then it's great for that sort of thing. So this is another area where it's, uh, MapReduce has uh, important limitations we have to talk about. But I should say, just you know, again, being a consultant, you have to think about what's actually going to work in IT organizations. And this does have a vibrant community that's moving the platform forward fairly quickly. In fact, it's tough to even keep up with what's going on. And also very important for your typical IT manager is that you, know, it, you can get good commercial support. And this stuff has been running for a long time in places like Yahoo. So um, it, it's pretty, you know, it's sort of the safe bet is what I'm saying, even though it may have its drawbacks. And unfortunately, as we were discussing in the panel earlier today, a lot of people will you know, think they need to get into the Hadoop world because they're missing out if they don't. And sometimes they really don't have enough data to justify it. So you sometimes have to deal with those uh, um, the misunderstanding of where, where the sweet spot is for this. Okay, so those are the advantages, but let's talk a little bit more about the disadvantages and uh, what we can do to address them. 
Well, the first problem I mentioned is that it's actually really hard to implement anything other than trivial algorithms in this MapReduce model. In fact, the people who do this all the time have a very specialized expertise in knowing what tricks to play with key construction and so forth to actually implement joins or implement group buys and things like that. And I think in, in the Hadoop case in particular, the Java API is particularly nasty and, and much harder to use than it ought to be. And it's very much an assembly language kind of thing when you work with it. So, this is actually the Java code for that word count program I just described. Um, it's deliberately too small for the, most of you to read. Maybe a few of you in the front rows can read this. And I'm certainly not going to go through all the details, but I do want you to pay attention to the colors, because after all, ever since we were like three years, three months old, we've been paying attention to colors, right? So, notice that the green is type information. And of course, this is Java, so there's no type inference, so the types are just all over the place and in your face. But it's the functions that actually do the real work, right? They're the things that do the transformations, and they're in yellow. So you can see there's a little bit of yellow here and a whole lot of green. And in fact, just uh, one thing I will point out is this is the reduce code that does that final summation. And you can maybe see that there's a void, or rather uh, a map method, and that's what did the tokenization and all that. And the rest of this is kind of ceremony and boilerplate to uh, uh, satisfy Hadoop and satisfy the Java compiler. So what do we do about this? So, so first, let's stay within the map reduce paradigm. Let's suppose we really want to use Hadoop. How can we make our jobs easier, make ourselves more productive? Well, we can certainly go to functional programming, as we all know, and one way to do that is to write SQL because it's you know, basically a functional uh, paradigm. And here, in fact, is word count in the Hive uh, query language. Hive is a dialect of SQL that runs on top of Hadoop. It doesn't give you transactions or uh, record level manipulation. But it is great if I just want to do like, you know, group by all these records and sum over the counts and all that stuff. It's great for that sort of thing. Now, in this particular case, I have to use a few built-in functions and a little bit of special stuff that's built into Hive to actually implement word count, which isn't really a traditional query. But nevertheless, it can be done. The first two lines create this table that are pointing to some path in the Hadoop file system. And the cool thing about Hive is if I've got data like column delimited data, or rather comma delimited data, you know, that, so that actually has a schema, it's in files in the Hadoop file system, and I'm creating this you know, table as if it's a database on top of it, and then I just write queries like I'm used to in SQL. So here's another fact, going, going back to industry and what it's really like out there. I work with a lot of big IT shops where the number of developers who could write Java is you know, you know, a few dozen guys, and then there's hundreds of data analysts that sort of working on top of them. You know, the guys that do the business analysis, that you know, look at what customers are up to, those people can write this. They have no hope, of course, of writing Java. So this is like one of the most important tools in the Hadoop ecosystem is this Facebook project called Hive that gives us a SQL dialect. Now, it turns out there's a couple of other options. A very curious thing that's happening is that Hive QL is becoming sort of a de facto SQL dialect that's now being adopted by other tools. Uh, in a minute, we'll talk about an alternative to MapReduce called Spark. And they're using, uh, they have a port of Hive called Shark, which is a per perhaps appropriate. Um, that's uh, almost close to maturity. It's still a little bit rough around the edges. And then there's a brand new system called Impala that was uh, developed by a Hadoop vendor that actually bypasses MapReduce. And it's based on a Google project, and well, actually it's on the next slide, called Dremel. So once again, Google invents something and the rest of us copy it. it uses a very fast backend in C++ and Java and often gives you 100x performance over Hive just by bypassing MapReduce because it's, MapReduce is not good for anything real time. It's great for large batch kind of projects. Okay, so if we can write SQL, that's really a great idea. But suppose we need something more flexible in SQL, like a Turing complete language. Well, maybe we can just raise the abstraction level and use an API that gives us more uh, of abstractions like data flow, you know, piping data through various transformations, and hides a lot of the complexity of the underlying ecosystem. And one of those uh, libraries is called cascading. And just a briefly terminology for cascading, you define a data flow, which is where you connect source and sync taps of data, you know, connected in the middle by pipes of transformations. And so word count would look something like this schematically in, in uh, cascading. 
it turns out each of these bubbles is, is called a pipe. I, I would probably use a different term and call the whole thing a pipe, but nevertheless, that's the terms that they use. So I'm going to set up a sequence of pipes that will do the splitting on some regular expression into words. We'll group by the words. So here's a term we should all know, I hope. And then I'll count each of those words. And I'll you know, start at some source of data in HDFS, maybe. It doesn't have to be HDFS, though. And then write the results back. And this combination of taps and pipes is called a flow. And this is what the Java code looks like. Now, this may not look like much of an improvement, at least in terms of size, from the uh, previous example. But actually, um, this is the whole program, except for maybe a few import statements. Whereas I actually left off the main routine in the previous example, which does a lot of boilerplate for setting up Hadoop and so forth. So this is actually more succinct. And even though there's still a lot of green type stuff and, and interesting things like group by and each and count that would actually be like you know, functions on collections with you know, taking anonymous functions as the uh, you know, arguments. So some of the type information is masking what we would in a functional language use as just built-in functions and anonymous functions. But nevertheless, a little bit less boilerplate and a lot more of the business logic is sort of seeping through the, uh, the picture here, but still a lot of green and so forth. Well, the nice thing is, there's actually a wonderful dialect of uh, cascading called Scalding, which is a Scala API on top of it. This is a Twitter project that's uh, um, it's actually getting a lot of traction now. And this is the same program, word count again, in Scalding. And now we're finally getting to something that we can get our heads around without you know, a lot of heartache. So a lot less green because uh, Scala, of course, can infer types. And we need f less type information anyway because mostly now we're we're calling yellow functions to do work. <coughs> and so we're doing things like flat mapping. You know, first we read the data, then we flat map over it to extract the words. And here's the, the logic, the anonymous function to uh, split the words, convert them to lowercase, uh, sorry, split the sentences, uh, just splitting a white space again. And then we group by each word, uh, and then we count the words, and then write the output. So even without understanding the idiosyncrasies of this API, just by reading the yellow, you can get a sense of what this is doing, which is a lot more like what we really want to do, right? And, you know, a DSL that expresses the problem and not gets us lost in the uh, uh, infrastructure we're working in. So this is actually my favorite way to write MapReduce programs in Hadoop right now is scalding. Although I will reach for Hive if it's a query problem first, because it's the easiest way usually to just ask questions of data. This, this yeah. compile, <clears throat> compile into code that runs on MapReduce? Or? Yeah, so what it actually does is, so it's a layer. We have the MapReduce Java APIs. Cascading is on top of that. And what cascading has built into it are actually generic data-driven map and reduce tasks that it configures to run the particular algorithm that you want to do. Actually, Hive works the same way. It doesn't actually synthesize any code like you know, generating Java code. It has generic mapper and reducers that are data-driven to do whatever the query is. And then this uh, scalding is actually uh, just calling the uh, cascading API behind the scenes because it's all Java, essentially, JVM stuff. It doesn't have to do any code generation. It just calls APIs. Okay, so it compiles this into instructions to send to existing MapReduce process. That's right. So yes, what you would see at the MapReduce layer is somebody somewhere on this chain submitted a MapReduce job to this thing that manages them. And you'll see these uh, mapper tasks, which are the JVM processes, the reducer tasks. And those are just boilerplate Java code that's provided by cascading. So this shape of the MapReduce job, is that a jar file that gets pushed into the system? How yeah. The code under the nodes? That's right. So typically, the way you run a MapReduce job is you would put your code in a jar file and then submit it through. It's, it's actually a bash script that submits it. And it just starts at the Java virtual machine and submits that job maybe over a network to the, the cluster that's running. Yeah, so it's, it pretty much looks like normal Java at that point. Uh, I'll just mention for completeness a couple of alternatives to cascading and uh, scalding are crunch for Java and a Scala dialect called crunch and then Scooby. And if you get the notes, there's links to all this stuff, but they're easy enough to Google as well. Although the word crunch is not particularly easy to Google, unless you maybe say Hadoop crunch or something. OK, so those are solutions for working within MapReduce, but being more uh, effective at it. What if we're willing to depart from MapReduce itself? Um, and one of the best options right now is a, what started as a, uh, a University of California Berkeley project called Spark, and is now a, a, an Apache open source project.
And it's really an alternative to MapReduce. It can, it can work with the file system if I have my data in HDFS, but it's actually much faster for most calculations because it's, uh, it's much smarter about caching data in memory, and also it doesn't have quite the chunkiness that the MapReduce paradigm has in uh, the traditional MapReduce design. So the problem with this, though, from practical terms is that uh, it's, not, it's, it's not a commercially supported tool. So if you're like you know, a middle manager in a giant IT organization, you're, you're probably not going to feel safe picking this. But if you're you know, more cutting edge like most of us in this room, it's a good alternative. And actually, it was originally designed for machine learning algorithms, which are kind of nasty to write in Hadoop. All right, well, just for completeness, here's what the Spark code looks like. It's uh, you know, conceptually very similar to the... Uh, uh, scalding code we saw a minute ago. Once again, it's very concise. I, I, I gave this talk not long ago, and somebody asked me about, well, are you sure that cascading and scalding are, you know, projects that are going to live and, and, and be viable for the long term? And my answer was, well, actually, I think that they are going to be viable. Cascading actually supported by a commercial company, and scalding is pretty heavily backed by Twitter. But the fact is, if I wrote this program, I would not care about throwing it away if I had to throw away Scalding, or in this case, Spark, because it's so small. And once I know how to write these, I can knock them off and test them so quickly. I really don't care about making that risky bet on something that might disappear, you know, maybe in a month or so. Uh, and I think this was the case that had the fewest number of explicit types. We just have three here. And one of them is just the, the Scala object that wraps the whole thing. All right, well, the next problem is it's not so great for real-time event processing. So what do we do if we want to solve this problem? Well, one of the interesting things that's emerging is a, another open source project called Storm that's specifically designed at real-time event stream processing at scale with reliable messaging and all that. Um, this was also, uh, this was actually invented by a guy who's now at Twitter named Nathan Mars. And if you, if you know anything, I, I, I haven't been mentioning closure alternatives to the Scalding APIs, and it's not, I'm not really not trying to be biased, but uh, there's a great closure API for cascading called Cascalog, and he also wrote Cascalog. So Storm is, is, is also getting a lot of attention. And schematically, this is sort of the terminology they use. Data sources are called spouts. And then processing logic that you combine together are called bolts. And the output of these bolts could be files, they could be other services, message queues, maybe HDFS, whatever you need to write to. So this is one way to do event stream processing, sort of analogous to message queues that we've had for a long time. There are some database options, though. So sometimes it actually makes sense. If, if I need to write data quickly to some store and get it back out quickly, maybe a record at a time, then a database makes sense. And you might even use SQL or NoSQL. It turns out that some of the NoSQL databases have pretty nice integrations with MapReduce now. So if I need to do MapReduce jobs, because I have these weird analytics that don't really fit a SQL query, but I really want the kind of transactional behavior for some definition of transactional, I want fast handling of data, then I might use something like HBase, which is built on top of the Hadoop file system or Cassandra, or one of those other NoSQL databases. And certainly, Reoc and, and MongoDB are also addressing these markets. So that I get the, boast of, uh, the best of both worlds that way. I think this is the last uh, issue with MapReduce. And that is that it's really not very good for graph processing algorithms. So for example, PageRank is really kind of a graph traversal problem, right? Uh, and MapReduce was invented in part to address it, but it's really not that good for graph algorithms. And con conceptually, this is the reason why. Um, for example, one of the graph algorithms is bulk synchronous parallel, where I'm going to allow each node to send zero or one messages to uh, its neighbors. And then all of those, in, you know, it, it, synchronously, they'll all send messages at the same time, or asynchronously, I guess, but anyway, in one iteration. Uh, and then each node might update some state or whatever. And then the next iteration will be the next series of messages and so forth. The problem with doing this in MapReduce is that either I'm going to have to start a new MapReduce job for every one of those iterations, which is very you know, heavyweight, or I'm just going to have to just use MapReduce as kind of a management tool and just completely subvert the paradigm and have my mappers and reducers do something entirely different on, on the inside, which is what people often do. Uh, and, and once, actually, if, just to make the point clear, if I do a separate MapReduce job for each of those iterations, I actually, the way it works is I have to write all that data to disk, you know, save the graph to disk, and then read it back in in the next iteration. So not very fast. 
So why not use some sort of uh, graph processing engine? Well, it turns out Google wrote one of their own called Pragel. Uh, Pragel is actually the name of the river in what was Konigsberg, Prussia, and is now uh, Kaliningrad, I think, Ukraine. Uh, and it was where graph theory really got its start when Leonard Euler pondered the problem. You know, there's seven bridges over the river, that the Pragel River that runs through this town, and there's like an island in the middle. Can you actually cross all seven bridges without backtracking? You know, that sort of math problem. And he proved that you couldn't do it. So, in fact, that was sort of the birth of graph theory, you know, graph traversal algorithms and all that. So that was why they chose this name Pragel. It use, uses this uh, bulk synchronous parallel uh, paradigm. The, the intention was actually to, to uh, re use Pragel for all the page rank, but I've actually heard that they haven't quite made that transition yet, and I don't really know the reason why. Uh, as some of you may know, graph algorithms, especially at scale, are particularly hard to figure out. For example, if you have a very complex graph with a lot of edges, where do you split it to move it to different clusters? And how do you handle the overhead of sending messages you know, where the edges are crossing a machine boundary? So there's a lot of issues there. However, if you want to pursue uh, your graph problems, there are some open source alternatives. The first two are, are also based on BSP, and then Aurelius uh, Titan is a, a different uh, system that actually runs on top of uh, uh, Cassandra, I think, as its store. Okay, so that's uh, one possibility, though, for dealing with graphs. All right, well, to wrap this up, let me, uh, let me express a manifesto. The first is that I think Hadoop is the enterprise Java beans of our time. Um, any of you actually ever do any EJB programming? Somebody's smiling. Okay. So you may remember that that was a bit clunky and heavyweight. And, you know, you sort of got your work done, but it was kind of obvious pretty quickly that it was the really the wrong way to go. And I think this is kind of the same thing with Hadoop. It's kind of a first-generation technology. It's been very successful in the market. It's gotten a lot of work done for people. But we've seen that there's some real issues with Hadoop in particular and MapReduce in general. So what do we do about this? Well, I think it's really essential that we stop using Java for this stuff because this data problem is really a functional problem. It's mathematics. We're applying mathematical operations to data. So we should be using tools that really express the, those ideas in the right paradigm. And there's certainly people who have made Java run very fast for particular problems, but it just exposes all the wrong abstractions. I've argued that objects are really the wrong abstraction for this, and the collections library in Java are nice in their way, but they don't give us things like folding and mapping and reducing and all the stuff we're used to. And of course, we're, we're only just now starting to get closures, or it's not even closures actually, it's just lambdas in Java, which is coming in the next release. So I really do think that we should just embrace functional languages because they're the, the ways that which we can most easily express our uh, paradigm, or, you know, the things we're trying to do, and one of those might be SQL. And also I think it's really important for us to embrace collections as really the uh, coin of the realm or the communications medium, whatever term you, you like, and, and the operations that are available on them that lets us do some very sophisticated transformations and combine them together to get our work done very quickly. I mentioned that MapReduce is kind of a very clunky, coarse-grained uh, paradigm, and I think the other thing we need to do is embrace fine-grained compute models, and one of the best ones is the actor-based model that's embodied in Erlang and Akka. Uh, so I, I really, it, there's actually, there's, there's sort of a, an opportunity, in fact. MapReduce is pretty good for this, these very large data sets where maybe I don't care that it takes 10 minutes for each reducer to run. But what about those middle-sized data sets, you know, like the 1 to 10 terabytes, where it's just a little too big for convenient use just on one machine, especially like a, a machine learning algorithm, but it's not big enough to really justify Hadoop. So I think that what we're going to see emerge is, is more use of tools that are much lighter weight, have lighter weight abstractions, fine-grained controls and combinators, you know, to build systems that address the middle market and then sort of eat their way up into the larger market, meaning larger data sizes as they get more mature. So final thought, uh, this was a tweet that came out uh, recently from a friend of mine with the new tech mullet, simple mobile interactions up front, big data in the back. And with that, I'll take questions. Stunned silence. Yes. So <clears throat> you mentioned that um, Hadoop is, is great for batch, but not very good for interactive stuff. But you also mentioned MapReduce, which, among other things, is actually well-structured for answering um, the kind of queries that go into Google. 
did you know, does Google use MapReduce for that? Or? Yeah, so the question was, and I forgot we have a microphone here, but um, does Google actually use MapReduce now? So my understanding... For answering queries. For answering queries. So I think the answer is no. What, what, one of the things I didn't show that a lot of the NoSQL databases were inspired by yet another Google paper at about the same time, early 2000s, on their so-called big, big table uh, key value store. So I think what they're doing with the output of the MapReduce calculations for PageRank is they're storing that data in big table or some store like that where they can do fast queries, uh, fast distributed queries. Uh, so no, they don't do it for any sort of uh, interactive real-time use. Although I think their version of MapReduce is a little bit more responsive and maybe a little closer to being suitable for real-time than the Hadoop version. Mostly because it's like you know, C++ and very lightweight and they've really worked hard on it to optimize it for performance. Uh, I didn't mention that early in Hadoop it was adopted by Yahoo and it sort of grew internally as a Yahoo project and around that 2006 time frame I mentioned, uh, Yahoo announced publicly that they were running a 10,000 uh, core cluster with Hadoop and that was sort of when it suddenly became something that everyone was talking about. But it, once again it was just doing indexing of the web in the background not serving up real-time queries. Uh, there was a question in the back. Yeah. Yeah, he was asking, uh, there, there's a, a, a streaming MapReduce uh, system that someone has worked on. I haven't had, had any experience with that, so I don't know how well that works. Y you know, you could imagine there are ways you could make it a lot faster, like why do we start up a JVM process every time? And there's actually some options that you can avoid doing that for every case. But, so there's, there's actually some work that could still be done in MapReduce to make it more responsive, which I think will happen because there's, there's a lot of pressure now on the community to address this problem. Other questions? Yes. You mean know, out in the field, I mean, how, how receptive is, is the general I mean, enterprise audience for, the, for this kind of data, idea? So are they still thinking that Hadoop is the only a true way? Or, or is it a reasonable simple thing to do to this new concept? Yeah, so the question was what about industry adoption for the alternative concepts as opposed to just going with uh, stock Hadoop? Uh, and the answer is pretty much what you would expect. In fact, a good analogy was what happened with Spring, the Spring framework, which was the real answer to EJBs back in the day, you know, about a decade ago now. And at first it was the more uh, leading edge thinkers, the more experimental kind of people who were willing to take a bet on Spring and question the, the, uh, the wisdom of, you know, the canonical stuff you're supposed to be using, which was EJBs. And that's pretty much what's happening now. So most people, especially if they're just testing the waters, uh, especially if they're in larger organizations, tend to be more conservative and want to go with something that seems to be well tested and commercially supported so they have someone to sue, uh, you know, when things go wrong. But then you'll find organizations or teams within larger organizations that will, you know, they'll experiment with cascading, or exp which is actually pretty safe, or experiment with Spark and, and some of the other things. But certainly, the, you know, the, the guy, people like Twitter and Facebook and all those guys that have really been living on the bleeding edge of, of big data have already... You know, they still use MapReduce for what it's good at, but they've definitely got a very heterogeneous environment now of a lot of different tools to ad address the different problems they have. Anybody else? All right, thank you very much.